Okay, welcome to video number two in the Green Reading series. This is Craig Hocknell, Director of Instruction at Glenwild Golf Club and Spa in Park City, Utah. And uh, I'm using some technology such as Google Earth and a Stracoline line to help you understand exactly how to read greens uh, more effectively so that you can make more putts. Uh, as a tour player, I used a lot of Google Earth as I traveled and played tournaments all around the world. Sometimes I wanted to get a sneak peek of that golf course and play essentially a virtual practice round. So I used the Google Earth technology to help me navigate and come up with a game plan going into my first real life practice round. There's been a couple of things that I've had to learn over the, the years of doing this that I want to share with you. Uh, one is that the greens books, like the Strackline book here, are measured in percentages of slope, not degrees. And in the back of the book here, you'll be able to see a percent to degrees conversion. And uh, I'll show you here, we have uh, a percent on the left-hand column, and we'll scan down here, we have, let's say, a 5 0.07 percent slope uh, but that's actually a 2.9 degree slope so if we go up here to the actual green book and we zoom in on it what you're gonna see is we have uh, percents of slope indicated here on the strack line book uh, we have a 7 percent slope a 2.7 percent slope a 3.2 percent slope now this is the slope that is measured um, between, uh, let's say, these two topographical marks. So uh, essentially the difference between slope and percent, slope is the percentage of change um, over distance, right? So if you're understanding that a degree, if I take a, a level and set the level on my table to find out if the table is level, and I find out that it's actually one degree off, that's just measuring that degree of angle at that, at that particular location. However, slope percentages are measured as a change in that particular angle over a distance. So for example, if we go back here to the green, if we look at the right-hand side of this particular green, we can see that this is measured as a 10 or a 6. So these are high degrees of slope, uh, 10 being a high point, measuring down very close uh, topographical lines here. As we come down, the lines start to separate. The further that separation, that means the slope is a percent of change over that distance. So as you get down into here, you can see that these little gray lines kind of are confused. They don't even know where they're going. Well, that is such a low amount of slope, essentially, that this particular one goes here, that one goes there. Um, it's essentially a flat zone, right? So if we go to this particular image right here, that same location, that blue spot where the arrows are going all over, that is a very, very subtle spot. We'll call it essentially flat. However, you'll learn that there are no flat spots on any greens. And the reason why there's no flat spots on greens is because a flat spot uh, or a low spot on a putting green would essentially become a puddle. And puddles are not good for putting greens because we like to keep our putting greens really, really fast, which means the leaf of the grass is really, really short. When you have a very short leaf, you typically also have a very low or very short root system. That root system, if it gets um, submerged in water and that leaf becomes submerged in water, we're not able to get the proper photosynthesis and the healthy growth of that, of that grass. So a green shaper and coarse architect do not want flat sections on any greens because that will cause puddling, which will cause um, that particular area to rot. And that is obviously not good. That section will die and we'll have problems there. So as you putt on a putting green, 100% of the time, water is purposely being moved because 
we are dealing with man-made greens. We are not out putting in the highlands of Scotland uh, with a stick in the ground chipping uh, goat pellets uh, hoping to get the ball in the hole. Uh, these greens have all been contoured in such a way so that the that water is being maneuvered in a healthy manner so that we have great uh, agronomy in our courses. So to kind of emphasize how this particular man-made water movement idea happens in general life, I've got a cross-section here of a road. Now, um, you know, granted you, you're probably living in an area that, that has streets and, and uh, you can go out and walk your street or you can drive your car down the street and start to notice these things, right? So for example, maybe this is a, a street in a, a hilly area and if you look over here to the left side of the screen, we can just imagine that we're here where it says back slope. We can imagine that hill continues up. So let's say it pours with rain. Um, this road is not here. Uh, the rain goes down, it comes down the slope, it flows down the, probably the natural shape of the ground over here toward this tree. Well, the architect and the, and the um, Department of Transport said, hey, I, we don't, we don't want to just leave this here and drive on the side of a hill because water is going to constantly come across this road, it's going to wash it out, and uh, we're always going to be repairing it. So let's put a road in here. But let's put the road in here in such a way that we can control the water because controlling water is a good thing. We can put a road where we want it to go and we're not going to have constant maintenance issues. So right here in the center of the road, you'll see the cross slope. And this section is, let's say, the asphalt area, the, the paved area, and then we have the rocky shoulder on the side. This is essentially the peak of that mountain. Because if water were to, to, to rain straight down on the top, the water would have a choice which, direc or which direction to go. If it rained slightly on this side of the road, that water would flow off the right side of the road across the shoulder over the hinge point and down toward the tree in a pretty direct line. If it rained slightly on the left side, it would hit that road, flow over here across the shoulder and into what you can see is a drainage ditch. So as you're out driving around, paying attention to just natural uh, spaces where man has come in and created roads, parking lots, buildings, etc., you'll start to see that shaping of the land is something that we've done uh, ever since we, dis we decided to make our own pathway through the world and we decided to not have to fight nature because Typically, anybody who fights nature is going to lose, as you probably well understand. So, the golf course designer is also fighting nature in a sense. We've gone back here to the first green at Glenwald. We understand that up here is a hill. And if, if I draw my line across down to the, the putting green, you can see how the hill kind of slopes across the road. Uh, we know that zooming in on this road, we know that the, the, the designer has also um, you know, made this road to camber, just like we talked about. So the water is going to be flowing over here to the left in this direction if it hits that side of the road. And if it hits this side of the road, it's going to flow in this direction here. Right? So we're always about controlling that flow of water. Putting greens are no different. So in this particular area, this is the first green at Glenwild. We know because we can see actually even from this aerial picture, we can see some of these drainage lines right here. Uh, this is probably a picture of the golf course early in the season. It hasn't reached its peak in the summer. Once it's reached its peak in the summer, um, after coming through the winter transi transition, you'll be able to see these beautiful mow lines and it will disguise any of these low spots. Um, but what you can see is actual drainage lines and just by you know being the director of instruction at this course I can tell you that right here in this location is a drain, uh, drainage grate, pretty large in size, uh, a foot to a foot and a half uh, large metal grate. Well where does that drain go to? Well, it probably goes to a very large drain 
which then flows in a couple of directions. Now, I happen to know that this is uphill where the green is, and back here toward the tee box is downhill. And one of the reasons why I know it's that is true is obviously I've been out there and played it. But if you look in this area, what you'll see is a natural wetlands space right here between these two tee boxes. As we follow this natural wetlands, we're going to follow where that droplet of water would essentially go combined from the architect and from nature, right? So if I go up here and I put, uh, uh, it rained right here on the first screen, that water is going to flow right here to that drainage hole. From this drainage hole, and I don't know the exact direction of the, the drainage of the course, it may flow directly underneath number two over to the wetlands in this direction, or it may flow directly back down the fairway, which is probably more logical because it would connect with other drains and continue to move down in this direction and eventually flow into the wetlands right here. Now I also know that the clubhouse and the swimming pool is much higher up than this wetland, so from the clubhouse that water would then flow through some drainage past the number two green down here into the wetlands and then it would follow this path, right? You can tell this is a much larger area, but at the bottom of it, you can just see from the color that the water would continue to flow. And as we zoom back out, that water is actually gonna flow down here to the east, right? All the way around the golf course, you can see it kind of connects over here. Then it's gonna flow this way to the south. It's actually gonna come all the way down this stream now the reason why I know this is because this area right across here um, between the highway and Glenwire Golf Club is a very sharp hill. So this is a hill, uh, kind of like a, a small ridge that runs around the top of the golf course here. When you go to the golf course, you typically take this path here called the Wiggly Mile and you meander your way up to the, to the clubhouse entry and from here you drop down to the golf course. So let's get back to where the water's going. It's gone out the golf course to the east through this uh, series of streams and now it's working its way along this beautiful stream that runs all the way here from east to west and guess where that then goes all the way downhill out here toward the natural progression, right? So as we look at this, as we go back here to the golf course, what we're going to find is that the golf course architect works with nature, works with the understanding of the turf grasses to make sure that water is channeled in a direction that is best for um, the, the surface, best for the grass itself, and then also provides the golfer with a challenge. So as you understand that that the golf ball is influenced by gravity just like flow of water is influenced by gravity you understand that reading greens is now going to become a, a, a perspective of understanding where's your high point and where's your low point once you understand green reading we can then move that into actual golf course strategy so we're going to continue on we're going to tackle each green as we go but hopefully this um, much bigger perspective has helped you understand that there are some myths out there. Uh, the ball is always, it's not always going to go away from the mountaintop. It's not always going to go to the water source. Um, man has an, has an option of designing the green to push the ball uh, using gravity and water flow wherever the architect wants. So let's get that straightened out first. And uh, in the next video, we're going to work on the first green pictured right here. Thanks for joining me.